from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, we're in for a treat right now. We're here to hear Richard Moe, and I know his friends call him Dick, discuss his extraordinary book, Roosevelt's Second Act, The Election of 1940 and the Politics of War. As the preface of the book notes, with the exception of Lincoln, no president has been more scrutinized than Roosevelt. Richard himself wrestles with this question right at the very beginning. After thousands of Roosevelt books, why do we need another one? And the answer is that most of what's been written about the FDR presidency is concentrated on the New Deal of his first two terms or his leadership during World War II. Roosevelt's second act is rooted in the years 1939 and 40 and focuses sharply on FDR's decision to defy tradition and run for an unprecedented third term. Moe deftly connects that decision to the outbreak of war in Europe and Roosevelt's desire to protect democracies from Hitler's rampage. The book opens, uh, as a, and as a fellow writer, I will say with a beautiful sentence which is Franklin Delano Roosevelt was an unusually sound sleeper. <laughs> he then goes on to describe Roosevelt being awakened on September 1st, 1939 by a call from the U.S. Ambassador to France who told him that German troops had crossed the border into Poland and were advancing rapidly. Richard Moe's experience served him well in writing this book. He was chief of staff to Vice President Walter Mondale and a senior advisor to President Jimmy Carter and someone that many of us who cover politics over the years got to know. As my colleague Dan Baltz, whom I regard as probably the preeminent political writer in this country, said of, of Dick, he has the perspective of a practitioner who understands the complexities of presidential decision making and he has applied his talents as a historian to probe the Roosevelt presidency in fresh ways. Richard was president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation from 1993 until his retirement in 2010. His previous books include The Last Full Measure, The Life and Death of the First Minnesota Volunteers, and Changing Places, Rebuilding Community in the Age of Sprawl. Let's please give a warm National Book Festival welcome to Richard Moe. Thank you, Kevin, very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a great treat to be here and a special honor to be introduced by Kevin Merida, a journalist that I've admired for so long. Uh, let me tell you uh, how honored I am to be at this book festival, the National Book Festival. This is, a, this is a unique institution, and I feel so privileged to be here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Library of Congress, as I know many of you are, and I can't tell you how much I admire and appreciate the job that Jim Billington and his staff have done in putting this festival together. Feel free to break in with applause any time during this address. And David Rubenstein also has helped very much to make this possible. Now, I have a confession to make. Sure, let's give David a hand, too. Attaway, there we go. <clears throat> I have a confession to make. Uh, I am not a professional historian. As a matter of fact, uh, I did not even study history in college. Uh, that's how bad it was. So you're getting everything you paid for here today. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I quickly learned the error of my ways, and I became a voracious reader of history uh, and a student of history ever since. And, and uh, I fell in love with history. And, and in particular, uh, uh, I stumbled across, I think, what, what is one of the most consequential periods in American history, but one, of, one that's been largely ignored by historians. And that's Franklin Roosevelt's decision to seek an unprecedented third term uh, in 1940. I've always been fascinated by FDR, largely because my two political mentors in Minnesota, Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale, had in turn been hugely influenced by FDR. 
And the Democratic Farmer Labor Party of Minnesota, uh, wh where I came of age politically, uh, had been steeped in the legacy of FDR. Now, I've become especially interested because of my service in the White House in presidential leadership and in presidential decision making. And I feel so fortunate <clears throat> that I came by this incident uh, in 1939, 1940 to write about. I didn't know much about FDR really uh, when I started this effort, uh, but someone, but I quickly came across someone who did know him very well, and that was Frances Perkins. Frances Perkins was the first woman ever to be a member of a president's cabinet. She was FDR's Secretary of Labor, uh, and she knew him beginning in 1910 when he showed up in Albany as a very young and somewhat arrogant legislator. Uh, here's what Francis Perkins had to say. Franklin Roosevelt was not a simple man. That quality of simplicity, which we delight to think marks the great and noble, was not his. He was the most complicated human being I ever knew. And out of this complicated nature, there sprang much of the drive that brought achievement. It made it possible for him to have insight and imagination into the most varied economic, <clears throat> geographical, social, and strategic circumstances thrust upon him as the responsibilities of his time. <clears throat> now, as Kevin said in his introduction, there have been literally thousands of books written about FDR, probably more than any other president except Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so why do we need another book? It's a very fair question. Well, as Kevin pointed out, most of those books have been written about either the New Deal years, which were obviously consequential, or increasingly his leadership during World War II. There has been almost nothing written about the connective tissue between those two epical achievements. And that connective tissue was the election of 1940, where FDR wrestled with whether or not to challenge history, challenge precedent, and run for a third term. During this period, <coughs> excuse me, of 1939-1940, he tried to prepare the country for the war that he knew was coming to the United States. And he tried to ensure that his successor in the White House was a Democrat who supported both his foreign and domestic policies and who could be elected in 1940. Uh, I tried to get into his head. You're going to have to excuse me because I have a little bit of a cough. Excuse me. I tried to get into his head, which was not an easy thing at any time, but it was particularly difficult uh, at this period. He, of course, wrote no memoir. Uh, he didn't confide much in intimates. He didn't have many intimates, as we will see. Uh, so it was very, very hard uh, to get, get into his head. Franklin Roosevelt won a huge landslide election in 1936. He carried all but two states. It was an incredible mandate that he had. Uh, but he misread his mandate, and he overextended himself beyond the mandate that he was, in fact, given. He experienced almost immediately through his hubris what we have come to know as the second-term curse. As a matter of fact, I believe he invented the second-term curse. Uh, he immediately set up a very uh, ill-considered uh, court-packing plan to the Congress, and it was immediately and decisively rejected. He took his foot off the economic accelerator, <clears throat> cut back on federal spending. Two million more people joined the unemployment rolls. We had what was known as the Roosevelt Recession of 1937-38. <clears throat> and in 1938, in the off-year elections, he tried, to, he tried to punish or purge uh, those recalcitrant Democrats who had opposed parts of his New Deal program. Uh, and, he, and he totally failed. So he had gone in two years from the high point of his presidency in terms of public opinion to the lowest point of his presidency, the nadir, uh, in 1939. Uh, the New Deal had already run its course. Uh, there was no more, there was no appetite for more of it. And FDR was, in fact, already shifting his attention from domestic and economic affairs to the foreign affairs, the, particularly the war breaking out in Europe. 
Now, he had planned to retire to Hyde Park after his two terms, which, of course, was the custom. The Constitution was then silent on whether or not a president could run for a third term. But the, but the custom started by George Washington and continued by Thomas Jefferson and others uh, became tantamount to law almost. It was such a deeply ingrained uh, and respected practice. Uh, very few had even considered challenging it, and no one, and no one had succeeded it. <clears throat> uh, he was going to retire because he said that he was tired and he was broke, and he was both. Uh, he had already designed and was then building the first presidential library uh, in America in Hyde Park, New York, uh, which has just been recently restored. I urge you to go see that. It's a fabulous, fabulous experience. He built a retreat called Top Cottage at Hyde Park where he could get away from the visitors that he knew would come in his post-presidency. Uh, he had signed a lucrative contract with Collier's Magazine to write regular articles. He was going to write his memoirs, and Harry Hopkins and Sam Rosenman, two of his top aides, were going to come to Hyde Park and do, do all of this. So the plans were set. He was thinking about retirement, and he was enjoying it. There were some, of course, third-term rumbles about whether or not uh, he really uh, might run, uh, but nothing to it. He didn't, he didn't give it any serious attention. Uh, then, as Kevin also mentioned at the very beginning of the book, uh, he was woken uh, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in the middle of the night, September 1st, 1939, to be told that Hitler had invaded Poland. Uh, and uh, Hitler had already swallowed the Rhineland, uh, Austria, the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, and now this was too much even for the appeasement policies of Great Britain and France both of whom declared war on Germany. So FDR's worst fears were realized. Major war was on the verge of breaking out in Europe, and the United States uh, was unprepared for it, uh, even though it wasn't directly threatened at that time. But what to do under these circumstances was one of the greatest problems to face a president, uh, I believe, since Lincoln faced the question of whether or not to resupply Fort Sumter. The U.S. had no military credibility, uh, and most importantly, uh, the country was heavily isolationist. There was a lot of disillusionment about American involvement in World War I. A lot of people didn't think we belonged there. Uh, and they thought that giving aid to Great Britain was the slippery slope to war again in Europe. What, he, what Roosevelt did do was to finally persuade the Congress to repeal the embargo uh, the arms embargo contained in the Neutrality Act, <clears throat> which he had earlier signed uh, to his regret. He immediately regretted it. So his, his strategy was to build a first line of defense for America through Britain and France by getting them the aid that they needed. Uh, now, he shaped this policy by himself. Try to picture this. Here we are in, in, what are we, 2014, I believe, right? 1940, there is no National Security Council staff in the White House. There is no staff in the White House with any substantive responsibilities. That's all out in the departments. So he, he made these decisions. He shaped this policy essentially by himself. There was no intelligence apparatus. There was no CIA or OSS. His, his means of getting intelligence as often as not was calling his Harvard classmates who were returning from Europe to come over and say, what, what have you heard? What, you know, what's going on over there? Everything was very ad hoc, and we would say very loose. Uh, and during all of this time, there's growing pressure on him to state his intentions of what he will do regarding the running again in 1940. Well, uh, letters and telegrams kept coming into the White House urging him to think about a third term, but he wouldn't address the issue. The press started calling him a sphinx because he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, address it. At the gridiron dinner uh, of December of 1939 down the street at one of these fancy hotels, the press mercilessly taunted him, oh great one, will you run? <laughs> 
and then they rolled out an eight-foot-tall papier-mâché sphinx with an oversized head of FDR, cigarette holder at a Johnny Angle. The place broke out in raucous laughter, and of course, no one laughed harder than FDR. He liked it so much, he bought it. And he, and he took it to Hyde Park, where I can now tell you it, it, it's out of storage and it's on display for the first time since 1939. Uh, <clears throat> so there are two major storylines here. War breaking out in Europe, and will he run? Uh, the real war breaks out in May of 1940, when Hitler invades the Low Countries and France, all of whom immediately fall, and Great Britain is hanging just by a very thin thread. So he, he is now two months away from the Democratic Convention opening in Chicago, and he has to sharpen his focus on what he's going to do. And this is where the decision-making process of Franklin Delano Roosevelt really gets interesting. Uh, many assumed that he was always running. Many still assume it, would always, it had always been his plan to run. And in fact, uh, there's no one that ever enjoyed being president more than FDR. Uh, but I have never found any evidence to support the fact that he had always thought of running. As a matter of fact, on the contrary. Uh, but nonetheless, this debate continues. And so I, I called up who I think it was the greatest living authority on Franklin Roosevelt, William Luchtenberg, who taught at Duke. And I put this question to him. Uh, what do you think? Did he always plan to run, or was this something that he came too late? And Bill Luchtenberg paused and said, uh, well, the only thing we know for certain about FDR is that he never left the presidency voluntarily. <laughs> Unarguable. Uh, uh, and he made this decision uh, entirely alone. Uh, FDR always needed people around him, even when the situation was tense, maybe especially when the situation was tense. Uh, but he was a very solitary man. Uh, there's no evidence that from the middle of 1939 or the beginning of 1939 until the con right before the convention that he spoke to a single individual about whether or not he should run again. Nor did he ever ask anybody to do anything to further uh, his cause. Uh, uh, that included Eleanor, it included Harry Hopkins, it included everyone on whom he was on, on, on intimate terms. And he finally, he waited until the very last minute to make th this decision, as he did many other decisions, because he thought it ultimately would be informed by more information. So what did I learn about who FDR was? Well, uh, as I say, he was famously social, but essentially solitary. He was grown up, he, he, was, he was raised as an only child uh, uh, on a remote estate uh, in upstate New York, few friends, fewer intimates, and he developed a degree, a level of self-reliance uh, that increased uh, over the course of his lifetime and certainly over the course of his career. Eleanor said he had no real confidants, not me either. Robert Sherwood, the very gifted playwright, <coughs> excuse me, who was, who was recruited to be a speechwriter for FDR, was, was a very, very astute observer of, of Roosevelt. And he ultimately uh, wrote the classic biography, Roosevelt and Hopkins, which if, if there is a Bible in FDR literature, that's it. It's, it. it's a wonderful, wonderful book, enormously insightful. And he got to know Roosevelt very well. He said Franklin Roosevelt has a thickly forested interior. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he had a thickly forested interior. He didn't want anyone to penetrate that forest to see what was going on inside. Uh, he was probably the most solitary president we've ever had. Uh, and uh, uh, very much a loner in that sense. I also learned, but I'm not alone in this, that there was a duality to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, he could be a bold, perceptive, prescient, uh, and moral statesman, set very principled goals for the country, no question about that. Uh, but at the same time, in pursuit of those goals, he could be cautious, ambitious, sometimes arrogant, manipulative, and even duplicitous. This is the contradiction that is FDR. This is why Francis Perkins said he was such a complicated man. And there's no episode in his presidency or in his life
that I think underscores this, uh, this duality more than, more than uh, this, this, this time does. Now, four days before the Chicago Convention opened, on July 11th, 1940, Franklin Roosevelt called Felix Frankfurter down from the Supreme Court. They had a two-hour session uh, in the Oval Study, adjacent to the President's bedroom on the second floor of the residence, not to be confused with the Oval Office. This is Roosevelt's favorite room. And they talked about this issue for two hours, and at the end of it, uh, Roosevelt said, I want you to write me a memo immediately about what you just told me on this. And he, Frankfurter said, of course, Mr. President, I will. I would like to request one also from Archibald MacLeish, then the Librarian of Congress, <coughs> Jim Billington's predecessor, if you will. Uh, and uh, yes, sir, Mr. President, but make it quick and keep it quiet. So he did. He returned the next day with two memos which I believe are the best window into FDR's mind on this question at this time. And I think they're so significant that they're fully reprinted in full in the, in the appendix. Uh, so what was going on in, in Roosevelt's head? The question was, was he justified in breaking this two-term limit by the emergency that he saw the country facing? Both Frankfurter and McLeish said, yes, you are, just, you are not only justified, but you have a duty to run because uh, the, of the direness of this emergency and because there is no one else. Uh, and in fact, uh, that is exactly what he did. He decided to run at that moment because of the war. He could not find anyone else who would support his policies and who could be elected. He had tried until the last moment to get Cordell Hall, the Secretary of State, to run, and Hall would not run. So he, he felt he had no alternative but to run himself. So he offered himself to the convention in kind of a thinly disguised draft. Uh, wasn't really kidding anybody about that uh, because there were plenty of support for him. Uh, but it set the stage for a very dramatic convention. Uh, some of it scripted, some of it very unscripted. And it contained a fascinating cast of characters, not least Eleanor Roosevelt and, again, Francis Perkins. Uh, there was a lot of resentment at that convention because they didn't, the delegates didn't feel that Roosevelt had been candid about his intentions. And then he picked Henry Wallace to be his vice president, who was not only anathema to most of them as a former Republican, as a, some thought a mystic, but it had always been the prerogative of the convention to pick vice presidents. FDR set another precedent when he, when he decided he was going to pick his own vice president. So there was a revolt going on at the convention. And Frances Perkins called the president. Uh, he listened to her. Uh, she pleaded with him to come to Chicago to address it. Uh, he said, no, I can't do that, Francis. Uh, they'll, they'll make me say things I can't say. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Then, but after, after a while, they agreed that Eleanor should come. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be good? Yes. They were, the president was very enthusiastic about Eleanor, and so was Francis Perkins. So they, they schemed together uh, to persuade Eleanor to come. And Francis Perkins, this is at a time when women did not play a role in politics. This is a very, very significant time. Uh, she asserted himself, and she had such respect with FDR that he listened to her. And she said famously uh, during her address to the convention, she said, you can't treat this as an ordinary nomination in an ordinary time. The next president will perhaps bear a larger, heavier uh, responsibility than any other man before him. This, of course, is the speech that Doris Kearns Goodwin, who will be here shortly, uh, turned into a wonderful book titled No Ordinary Time. This is where that comes from. Uh, and Eleanor's speech made the difference. Henry Wallace was nominated narrowly, but the revolt was, was off, uh, and the convention adjourned uh, without more turmoil. Another important character of this period was Charles A. Lindbergh, famous aviation hero, much admired, but he was also the leader of the isolationist movement. Uh, Roosevelt detested him. 
Uh, he said, if I die tomorrow, remember one thing, Charles Lindbergh is a Nazi. <laughs> Charles Lindbergh was many things, he was not a Nazi. But he had been used by the Nazis uh, when, on three trips, uh, inspe military inspection trips to Germany during the late 30s. Wendell Wilkie, if there's a secondary hero to this story, it's Wendell Wilkie. Uh, one, he's now uh, little remembered, uh, unfortunately, because he was a very significant statesman. Uh, and uh, he, he was the utilities executive, but he's very charismatic. And he came from nowhere, classic dark horse, captured the Republican nomination, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and charmed the Dickens out of the Republican Party. Uh, but there were some that didn't like him, that, did, that resented him. The old-style conservatives didn't much care for him. Uh, because he had so recently been a, been a Democrat. And this was personified uh, at one point uh, by a chance encounter Wilkie had in the hotel lobby uh, with a former senator from Indiana, James Watson, former Senate Majority Leader, who said, Wendell, you're a nice fellow, but I don't much like your politics. Uh, Wilkie said, well, it's true, Senator, I was a Democrat uh, until recently, but I am now a Republican. I've seen the light, and I plan to win this nomination. Well, Wendell, back in Indiana, uh, we let the town whore into church, but we don't let her lead the choir on the first night. Uh, they, they, they all got over it uh, eventually. Uh, but where where Wendell Wilkie really distinguished himself, during the election, he, he took a very courageous stand in favor of the first peacetime draft in American history. Roosevelt did too, and with their combined support, they got it enacted. But where he really shone, in my view, was after the election, he said, we only have one president now. It's Franklin Roosevelt, uh, and he has my support. And he chose, they had a famous dinner together, just the two of them, the night before Roosevelt was inaugurated for the third time. And Roosevelt sent a handwritten message to Churchill via Wilkie, who was then on his way to London. Wilkie was so moved by what he saw during the Blitz in London that he came back and testified very passionately and very effectively for Lend-Lease. And FDR never forgot it. He said, we never could have la had Lend-Lease. Lend-Lease, of course, made the United States the great arsenal of democracy during World War II. Made a huge difference. And, uh, and uh, it was uh, a marvel. He probably ruined his chances for the 1944 nomination in that act alone, because virtually every Republican leader in the country urged him not to do it. Winston Churchill, of course, played a very key role here. Uh, they had only met once at a dinner uh, in London in 1918 during World War I. Churchill never remembered the encounter. Uh, Roosevelt never forgot that Churchill never remembered the encounter. <laughs> but Roosevelt was, was uh, courting, or excuse me, Churchill was courting Roosevelt very heavily during this period uh, in order to get more arms. Uh, uh, for, for defense against Hitler. And he especially needed destroyers, escort vessels, which were the, the U-boats were taking out regularly. Roosevelt finally found a way to get the destroyers to Britain without going to Congress. This was no small thing. But he had to do it in such a way that it appeared to be a trade for the use of British bases in the Caribbean. And, and Churchill was worried that, he, that Roosevelt was going to portray this as, as the United States having gotten the better of the bargain. Well, being an astute politician himself, he didn't really want that interpretation to reach Britain. So to work it out, Roosevelt arranged a transatlantic telephone call, and he got his attorney general, uh, Robert Jackson, on the phone to explain that this had to be a trade or a bargain. Well, Churchill said, empires just don't bargain. Attorney General Jackson said, well, republics do. And uh, Roosevelt <clears throat> tried to smooth the waters here by saying, you see, Winston, uh, the problem is I have this attorney general, and he says we have to bargain. And Churchill said, unmoved, maybe you ought to trade these destroyers for a new attorney general. <laughs> They got it worked out. They got it worked out. 
FDR, in the general election, FDR basically ran as commander in chief. He was running against Adolf Hitler, uh, according to the Republicans. Uh, kind of a variation of the modern Rose Garden strategy. Uh, he was doing inspection tours, uh, but not campaigning as a candidate. Uh, he did, however, during the midst of this election, take two very, very courageous decisions. One was for the first peacetime draft in American history. The other was the destroyer's deal, for which he thought he could potentially be impeached. <clears throat> in any case, Wilkie succumbed to the advice of the Republican leadership and made the war the issue. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he, he said, if you vote for Roosevelt, if Roosevelt's elected, the boys are going to be on the transports by April. Uh, he started calling Roosevelt a warmonger. The polls started closing. And uh, Roosevelt was very worried, smoked him out, had to go out and campaign, Dis discard this, uh, this disguise as commander-in-chief and actually be a candidate. The polls closed so rapidly that Roosevelt thought he was probably going to lose. And on election night, uh, on November 5th, 1940, he closeted himself in the dining room at the big house at Hyde Park, where he always received the returns. And he saw something in the early returns that he didn't like. And he turned to a Secret Service agent, Mike Riley, and he said, Mike, close that door. I don't want to see anyone. Well, he had never done this before. And he had broken out in a sweat. Uh, and Mike Riley said, you mean, you mean your family, Mr. President? I said, anyone. And the door closed for 45 minutes. FDR was not heard from. What went on in his mind during that period uh, is an historian's gold, but nobody will ever know because he never wrote it. He never told anybody what was in his mind. Uh, that didn't keep me from speculating a little bit in this book, uh, but that's the license of an historian. Uh, in any case, he won the election. Uh, and this election, I maintain, uh, was one of the most consequential in American history. And his decision to run for a third term really was justified. Uh, the first consequence was that it put in place a man of proven experience and ability to lead this country through World War II. And we're now seeing evidence of, of how he took command of the Anglo-American Alliance immediately after Pearl Harbor, and among other things, stopped the alliance from, from launching an across-the-channel invasion of France in 1942, which would have been an unmitigated disaster. Uh, George Marshall uh, was the primary proponent for that. Uh, this election began the eclipse of isolationism in America. America had always been an isolationist nation, but ever since then, we have always been engaged for better or worse, and often for the worse, uh, in, in the rest of the world. Lend-Lease and the destroyer deal really set, uh, planted the seeds for the national security state that we have become today. Uh, it will change the way we think about the presidency. Before 1940, we seldom, if ever, thought, is this someone, a presidential candidate, who is capable of conducting foreign policy and protecting the American people, which is the, which is the premier uh, uh, responsibility of any president. So, as I, as I said, I think 1940 was, was one of the most consequential elections uh, in history. It's right up there with 1864 when Lincoln ran for re-election during the Civil War. And altogether, it was an extraordinary example of presidential leadership. Roosevelt set his sights on saving Britain and giving the United States the time it needed to prepare for war, which he knew was coming. He concluded that he could only accomplish that goal if he challenged 150 years of American history and ran himself, and he did. It was a messy process. It was not always pretty, but I would argue that it got the right result for the country. We will never get fully into FDR's mind on what he was thinking during this time, but this book is simply my own effort to try to penetrate that thickly forested interior that Robert Sherwood talked about. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's take some questions. If I recall correctly, uh, Roosevelt ran in, uh, 
on a platform in 40 of, of not getting into war. Am I, am I correct? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Is your mic on? Could you speak a little closer to your mic, please? If I understand correctly, in uh, 40, didn't Roosevelt run on a platform of keeping us out of war? Uh, he said he had no plans to, to take the country into the war, but he became a little vague, a little opaque as the election came, came near. So he, he was, uh, it was his intention to keep the country, he had always said he intended to keep the country out of the war, but he did not want to take a hard and fast pledge that he would never get involved. In, 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 and so there was a lot of wordsmithing going on on that campaign train those last two weeks. I guess my question is, was that a cynical decision to, to get elected? Uh, had, he, had he taken a, a, a position that would, he would support? No, I, 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 don't, I, don't think there, I don't think it was cynical. Uh, there, there are reasons to be cynical about FDR. I, don't, I think he was absolutely sincere in, in wanting to protect. He knew this country wasn't ready for war. And he could not get the country excited about, about this at this time, uh, uh, or the, the whole thing would unravel. So I don't think he was cynical. I don't, I don't think he was duplicitous about this. He was, a very, he was a consummate politician. There's no question about that. And he would work politics into everything he did. But his main purpose here was to put off the war, put off American engagement in the war until we were prepared for it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Henry Wallace always seemed like a strange choice for a vice president. Uh, it's hard to imagine FDR thinking of him as a successor. Uh, did you study much about how he actually settled on Wallace? Yes, uh, he uh, he had a field of candidates uh, that he that he wanted. It, it was basically Jimmy Burns, or Cordell Hull, or Henry Henry Wallace. Uh, Jimmy Burns was too controversial. He had been a Catholic who had given up his Catholicism, and he's from South Carolina, and he was a segregationist, and that wasn't going to work, although he admired Burns in many other ways. Hall would not only run, not run for president, he would not run for vice president, uh, which really left Wallace in Roosevelt's mind because he was an adamant advocate of the New Deal. He totally faithful to the New Deal. Uh, uh, but, but there are some other questions about him uh, that, that later surfaced, uh, so we'll never know uh, what kind of president he would have been. Yes, sir. Sir, we've uh, seen all those films in the newsreels of uh, Roosevelt, and it never once shows that he actually was quite handicapped. I was wondering, like a farmer out in Minnesota or Indiana, would they know that their president was able to walk and was stuck in a wheelchair? That's a really good question. Uh, the, uh, there are only four known photographs uh, in existence of Roosevelt in a wheelchair. Uh, he did not go out of his way to, to dramatize that, obviously. Uh, he would out, when he was standing, he was always he was standing with the assistance of a military aide or one of his sons. So he could walk, but with assistance. Uh, and, but, and usually he was in the back of a convertible, waving. So people knew that, that he had suffered from polio. People knew that there was something not, but he was so ebullient in his personality that it took the focus off of any disability that he, that he had. So he wasn't really being duplicitous about that because everybody knew that he had, a lot of people knew that he had the disability. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't out there in front. Thank you. So, yes, sir. Roosevelt's relationship with John Nance Garner to what extent was Roosevelt concerned that Garner could become his successor in the event that he didn't run? And what was his thinking about uh, his successor prior to the outbreak of war in Europe in 1939? What do uh, we know about Roosevelt, that? Roosevelt and John Nance Garner had a good relationship in the first term. Of course, they, he had become vice president because of a deal that was made in 1932. Garner brought the Texas delegates and the California delegates to get Roosevelt the two-thirds he needed in the convention. Uh, but the second term, starting with the court packing plan and particularly with the purge effort of 38, destroyed their relationship. They detested each other. And Garner announced that he was going to run regardless of what Roosevelt did. He never had a serious chance of, of getting the nomination, nor did he, I think, believe that himself, but it was mostly spite and he was trying to make a point about, about no third term. So they had a disastrous relationship, and I don't think he ever thought that, that Garner would be or should be his successor. Yes, sir. 
Um, you, you mentioned uh, Lindbergh and the isolationists. There were also uh, very strong right-wing uh, organizations, the Bund, uh, American Nazis. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the, their role uh, during, in politics at that time? Well, the, actually, there were Nazi agents in America uh, at that time, uh, as there were British agents uh, at that time, trying to influence U.S. policy, particularly in terms of the Neutrality Act and aid, aid to Europe. And uh, there were some Nazi agents that actually drafted some language for some com mem Republican members of Congress that ended up in the Republican platform. Uh, now, the British were trying to do the same thing uh, with Roosevelt and with the Democrats. Uh, so there was, a, the, 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 there was a lot of foreign interference, you might say, uh, in, in, a, in a very important domestic election. And, and there were obviously agents uh, uh, abroad elsewhere as well. What about homegrown uh, right-wingers? Well, uh, there, there are no doubt were some. Uh, there, there clearly were some. Uh, I don't have, I, I, I don't really have any insight into that. Uh, uh, but I'm sure they were around. They're usually around, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, at the convention, didn't Roosevelt actually orchestrate a uh, uh, Volks Populi, and didn't he yes. really want to run, but, <clears throat> but he wanted the people to ask him to run, or the delegates? Well, that's, that's essentially correct. That's why I said it was a thinly disguised uh, draft. And uh, when, what happened was that when... Uh, when the Speaker of the House uh, gave his, his keynote address, uh, the first time that he mentioned Franklin Roosevelt's name, uh, there was a pause, there was a pause uh, in the audience, and, and nobody quite knew what was going to happen. Then out of these, all these m megaphones uh, all over the arena came, we want Roosevelt. Illinois wants Roosevelt. New York wants Roosevelt. I mean, that's, that's what happened was that the mayor of Chicago, uh, Ed Kelly, had put his sewer commissioner in the basement of the uh, of the uh, of the of the hall with a microphone, Amazing. and he he did this. And every so often he would pop up and wave at the mayor, and say, "How's that? You know, aren't I doing? Aren't, aren't I doing well? You know." So, so that's what it was. It was, a, it was nothing impromptu about this. This was, uh, uh, I don't think Roosevelt was behind, but, but everybody knew what was going on. And of course, there was an enterprising New York Times reporter uh, who went down the basement to find out what was going, and this became known as the voice from the sewers. <laughs> yes. Uh, why, last, why did Roosevelt, last question, I'm told. Why did Roosevelt run for a fourth term when the war was practically won? Well, it wasn't clear that the war was won, but I, you know, I, I, th he was in very, I think he was in pretty good shape when he ran in 1940. In 1944, he was not in good shape. He should not have run in 1944. But it was during the war, and he obviously took the, he, he was going to Yalta. Uh, he, was taking, he was taking what he thought was the, was the best course, continuity. He wanted to see it through. But in fact, he was in very fragile health at that time, and uh, you can make a good, and that was the persuading fact uh, that determined the Congress to pass the, the, uh, the amendment limiting presidents to two terms, so. Uh, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.